Impressions for today, all multicolored ones to me. <laughs> Excellent, here we go, the first one. Number one, how do we make this ego self extinguish quickly? I don't know why I cling to suffering even though it hurts. Theoretically it's simple to let go, but the mind just won't. Solution, you come to Jhana Grove, that's a solution. You practice first of all the different types of letting go. So first of all, you, if you want to really get rid of your ego, you've got to let go of everything. So let go of all your money, the donation box you find out of. <laughs> let go of your hair. <laughs> no. <coughs> no, what it really means, the ego self, to let it go, is remember sometimes the ego, the self, is always how you compare yourself to other people. So much of the ego, the word for ego in Pali is mana, it's like conceit. So it's a word for conceit, it's also the same word for judging. And that was really interesting to use linguistics to know what your ego does, it judges and compares yourself to who you want to be. That's called ego. Or you compare yourself to others. And that's called ego. And what are you doing that for? Comparing yourself to others. So there's three conceits. This comes from the ego. The conceit, you're better than other people. And we all know that one. But I was really surprised and so overjoyed to see that was only a third of the three conceits. The other one is, you are worse than other people. And it's amazing how many people have that conceit. They measure themselves, oh, I'm not good enough. You know, the, the monks say, oh, I'm not as good as Ajahn Brahm. Ajahn, I'm not as good as Ajahn Chah. Ajahn Chah thought, oh, I'm not as good as, Ajahn, as the Buddha. Well, it's so <laughs> stupid to think like that. There is, you can't compare yourself to anybody. There's only one Ajahn Brahm, thank goodness, <laughs> who tells stupid jokes. There's only one of you, thank goodness, too. <laughs> And you can't say that's the second conceit, I'm worse. You're not worse. You're not better than other people. And the third conceit, we're all the same. That is obviously stupid. You're not all the same. You just have to look at you. If you're all the same, we'd only need one set of toilets in this place. We at least have two types of toilets, so at least you know you're not the same. <laughs> so <laughs> whatever, you aren't the same. You're not, you're not different. You know, you're not sort of... Um, better, you're not worse, we just don't judge. And what a wonderful world that is, when you don't judge yourself, you don't compare who you are against other people, you can just be anybody or nobody. And that's actually how we get rid of non-self, stop judging and comparing. So how's your meditation been so far this retreat? Stop judging! Just, no, just, it is, that's all. And if you judge, you know what happens, many of you, this is not your first retreat, you've been here before, and you think, this retreat is not as good as the last one. <laughs> That's suffering, of course it's not the same as the last one, it's totally different. So just forget about judging and comparing. And if you don't compare yourself with others, you don't even compare yourself with yourself, then you're totally free. And much of this thing about ego, always trying to be better, trying to achieve these goals in life. You know what it's like when you're first born, you, you go into these schools and you have to sort of, your mum and father says, do better, and you do really well, you work really hard. That's my story, I went to, my family were really poor, I went to the primary school, you know, its name was Derwent Water, we used to call it as kids Dirty Water School, that was its nickname. In a really poor, lots of migrants, and I didn't realise, but that was a poor school. And so my parents said, no, work hard, you know, make something. So I worked hard and then went into a big school, which was you know, one of the really good schools in West London. And then, you know, you were really having a hard time the first year, but work hard and just keep on striving. And every time I got top of something, I got promoted somewhere else where you had to come bottom and start all over again. <laughs> You know, and it was just total. And then you went to Cambridge, and then again you started at the bottom, you had to work your way up again. And it was endless. I had enough about that by that time. I didn't want to go comparing myself. Then you went off to work. 
You know, or you go looking out for a partner in life. Who's the most pretty? Who's the, the toughest guy or whatever? He says, compare yourself with other people. That really sucks. And then, you know, you have a relationship, it doesn't work out, you get another relationship and your girlfriend or your wife compares you to her first boyfriend. And that really is really a lot of problems. Yeah, cool. I'm not the same, I'm not better, I'm not worse. Okay, don't judge for goodness sake. What's it like to be judged? It really sucks, doesn't it? It's just terrible because how can anybody judge who you are or what you do or why you do it? And that really sort of destroys people. That's why every one of you who have come for an interview, have I ever judged you? You come up to the interview and I always say, it's well known, and say the same words. You say, I've been sleeping for the last three days. And what do I say? Very good. You say, I've just become enlightened. And what do I say? Very good. You said, oh, you know, that, that person in the next room has always been snoring, making the noise. I, I murdered them last night. <laughs> and I say, very good. <laughs> I'm not going to judge you. That's somebody else. And isn't it so nice? If ever you meet someone who doesn't judge you at all, you feel totally accepted for who you are. You don't have to be any better than you already, already are. At last, you can be at peace. That is what we mean by letting go of ego. Stop trying to improve your meditation. Those of you trying to improve your meditation are going to suffer terribly. It's nothing to do with you. Stop trying to improve yourself. Just be who you are. Let go of all wanting. And then your ego disappears because you're not judging. So you can try that for the rest of, well, until you forget about it. That's what I always do. I give all these little nice interesting pieces of advice. You think, oh, that's really good. And then by tomorrow morning you've forgotten it, so I'd have to say something else. But it's a wonderful, do the no judging meditation. I'm just sitting here, I'm not going to judge, I'm not going to compare whether this is better or worse than what it was yesterday. And then you can't strive anymore. As soon as you stop judging and comparing and measuring, all strife disappears and with it your ego goes. This was years and years ago, somebody, they knew I was a physicist, they asked me about this famous saying of Lord Kelvin, William Thompson, he was before he became a Lord, who was one of the founders of science. And he was, he was a head of the Royal Society or something. And he made, he's a philosopher, very smart guy, who said, if we want to control nature, we have to learn how to measure nature accurately first of all. This was the beginnings of what was called the Industrial Revolution. Before we could have machines, we had to learn how to have accurate measurements of time, you know, distance, weights. And so much of science was about accurate measurement, first of all. And when someone asked me that question, it was obvious, turn it around. If we want to control nature, we have to measure her accurately. What if you don't measure anything? then you can't control anything. And have you noticed that's what governments do with censuses, getting all your information, what Google does? They measure you. And once you're there, you got measured, then you can be controlled. <laughs> be careful. But your mind, if you don't measure your mind, then you can't control it anymore. You have to let go. And with it, you vanish. It's beautiful, non-measuring. And I know I'm supposed to be a Theravada monk, but for those of you who know some Mahayana teachings, that is the first lines of the poem of the third Zen patriarch. The path is easy for those who make no comparisons or no judgments. So stop judging. It's beautiful, you don't have nothing to do. You, when you don't judge, you know, how might, is meditation good today or bad today? I don't know. It just is. So you can at peace at last. So don't try and improve yourself. If you want to improve yourself, it means you don't like yourself as you are. What are you doing that for? You're okay. 
actually, you are all very good. <laughs> so here you go. Does a teddy bear measure himself? We have those really naughty with the nuns. <laughs> he does it, he's just being a teddy bear, that's all. So that's how to extinguish it, very quickly. After we die, we, after we die we're going to get near-death experience. So why? We need to get jhanas now. <laughs> yeah, just go home and just watch the TV. Go watch a movie, don't even bother coming here. <laughs> Number one is because you come to meditate, you get happiness and you get some peace, you get some wisdom, which is what we want before we die. A lot of people just want to get some wisdom and peace now. Otherwise you've got to endure so much suffering until you die. And also, when you do die, you get these nimittas, sometimes you don't know what to do with them. So, so many people, when they die, have these near death experiences. They get this beautiful light, but they don't really know what it is. Now imagine having some rehearsals <laughs> of dying. This is learning how to die, because you're all going to die. Many of the other things you do, I mean, before you drive a car, you know, you do a practice first of all. You know, before you commit to a partner, you know, you do many practice runs first of all. You know, even you go through a marriage ceremony, you have the rehearsals first of all. So most of life we have rehearsals, we learn how to do it, driving a car, driving an aircraft, we get all the information first, then we give it a go, but dying? No one tells us how to do it. And we're just there, you know, you just, well, what am I supposed to do now? And they don't, don't even tell you, said, oh no, just relax, be peaceful. It's such a sad thing, you're dying. But uh, no, I'm going to die anyway, how do I do it? Wouldn't you like to know beforehand what's going to happen and how to do it? So this is where you learn, this is dying 101 class. <laughs> Learning how to die, letting, because what is dying anyway? But letting go. Letting go of all your attachments, because you cannot take it with you. Okay, this is an old joke, I haven't told enough old jokes yet. You can't take it with you, but there was a lawyer in Singapore who thought they could take it with them. So he was on his deathbed, he had it all planned, when the doctor said, no, there's no hope at all, one or two days you're going to die, he called his, called his wife in and said, right, go to the bank with those two big suitcases in the cupboard and fill them with, I think, 1,000 euro notes. That's the biggest bank note, I think, isn't it? Well, whatever. Fill it with notes, there's plenty of money in my bank. And bring them home and place them in the attic, directly above my bed. <laughs> so that when I die, I can grab them on the way up. <laughs> nice plan. And so his wife was, no, okay, I'll do that for you. And so she went to the bank, filled up these suitcases with millions of, of banknotes, and placed them in the attic right above his bed. And a couple of days later, the doctor was right, he died. The day afterwards she checked and those suitcases were still there, stashed with cash. And as she took them down, stupid old man, she said, he should have put them in the room underneath his bed. Because <laughs> I know which way he was going. <laughs> so that's just an old joke, but it's a funny one. So yeah, you do get a near-death experience, but you've got to learn how to do, deal with it. So you learn it here, first of all. Are you planning another six-month retreat? My plans are very secret. They're so secret, even I don't know them. <laughs> you don't make plans. Every time I make a plan, it's just so much problems and difficulties, and oh, I just have to arrange all this and arrange all of that. There's so much work making a plan, and I made so many plans in my life and they all go wrong, it doesn't work. And it's the same when I don't make a plan, it, or everything goes wrong. I found out if you make a plan or you don't make a plan, whichever one of those two it is, things go wrong anyway. So knowing that you make a plan, you don't make a plan, it's all the same, I prefer not to make plans. Things are going to go wrong, so who cares? So I enjoy things before they go wrong. <laughs> so stop planning so much. If you are going to make a plan, 
please make it out of rubber. So you can bend it whichever way you like. Because too many people make plans out of concrete. In other words, you have to do this. And just, it's obvious you should give up that plan. It's a waste of time. There's much better options. But no, this is my plan. And I'm going to stick to it. I'm going to get there. Even if it kills me. And it usually does. Absolutely ridiculous and stupid. So all my plans are just so tentative. And even what I'm going to say, I don't know what I'm going to say. But anyway, most venerable Ajahn, can you please read the questions slowly that we old people can hear the questions before you answer? <laughs> I will only do that, no, if you want me to read them slowly, you've got to write them slowly. Most questions are, are written very fast, so that's why I have to read them fast. I'll read what's written down there. If it's written fast, then I'm going to read them fast. I know everyone has their own problems when they come into Jhana Grove to meditate. What do you mean? Not everyone has their own problems. These monks don't have problems. We're just fine. For me, I have a relationship problem. <laughs> I don't. which I can't come to terms with even right now. And it is only when I meditate that I can put down those problems aside temporarily. I look forward to meditating because that's the only time I don't feel troubled. Even if it's just a short period of time that I find stillness, it is good enough. No one is born talented in meditating, so I hope to extend this stillness bit by bit over time. Very good. The method of the ugly monster that you mentioned, I used it to hug and embrace it when thoughts of the past came up, and it works after a while, only this time I turn it into a lovely bear, so I look forward to hug her. What do you mean, her? <laughs> That's my bear, it's a him. Rejecting the thoughts really makes it worse. Comes back double time, it works. Thank you, Ajahn. Yeah, it does. Relationship problems, look. If you have a relationship, you have relationship suffering. All relationships are difficult. You know, learning how to live with somebody else. Imagine what it's like living with you. <laughs> then you understand what a relationship problem is. So what happens if you get rid of that, uh, that partner and you're by yourself? Are you happy? No, because then you have single person suffering. So you just get rid of the relationship suffering, now you have single person suffering. And then you find another partner, you don't have single person the loneliness suffering anymore, you have another relationship suffering. And so that's what people do, you know, they sort of find a partner and they say, this doesn't work out, they'd rather be by themselves. And they'd rather be by, they're then by themselves, they really want a partner. And they're always going backwards and forwards this way and then they finally think, I know what, I'll become a monk or a nun. <laughs> and they become a monk or a nun, then you have monk or nun suffering. <laughs> You know, you don't escape suffering by you know, changing your partner or becoming single or shaving off your hair and becoming a monk. It is the craving and expectations causes suffering. So if you want to have a happy relationship, you now the advice I gave today, this afternoon, at, uh, after the lunch at the Bodhidharma Monastery, if you want to have a happy relationship, if you're a girl, please choose a poor boy. Because if you marry a rich man, he will have money, enough to afford a mistress. And you may come here to Jhana Grove to meditate, and you won't know what your husband is doing when you're over here, because he's rich. If he's poor, he won't be able to afford a mistress. So you're perfectly safe. You can come over here and be totally relaxed. He's too poor. No woman would they only want to go out with a wallet, no, not the man. And you're happy forever. And if you're a guy, please marry an ugly girl. Because if you marry or go out with a beautiful girl who's you know, really hot and drop dead gorgeous, of course you'll always be jealous. And all these other sort of guys will be looking at her and talking to her. And it means you can come over here to Jhana Grove and you think, my goodness, what my, what my wife is doing when I'm away, she's so gorgeous. 
But if she's ugly, no one will want her. You can leave her at home and go overseas for a couple of months, you're perfectly safe, you know that she's going to be there when you come home. So that is obvious. That's why people get into trouble with relationships. Girls always want to go out with rich guys. You know, you're going to be let down later on. Go out with poor guys. And boys want to go out with pretty girls. You're suffering. Go out with an ugly one. And then you have a wonderful relationship. And you won't have these relationship troubles ever again. Solved. Very easy. <laughs> <laughs> so please, if you, are, if you are beautiful, you girls, please go to ugly parlour. Don't go to beauty parlour, go to ugly parlour. <laughs> and guys, if you're rich, you know where the donation box is, I can help you. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Following on from the neurological or neuropsychological benefits of bowing, no, I say it releases the, uh, what's it called, it? The nitrous oxide, which gives you a high. I came across some research recently, uh, Cuddy, a psychologist, a great TED talk, that when we put our hands above our heads and, and raise up our hearts, our testosterone goes up, cortisol goes down, and we are more likely to take risks. So the hidden benefits of sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Your testosterone goes up. <laughs> no, it doesn't. I'm living proof that it does not. I reject that. <laughs> no, ma'am. Here's a good question. Why nuns seem to be less important than monks? They get their food last and are always after the monks. Not many of them are known as great leaders or enlightened Buddhists. What if the Buddha was a woman? There is a reason for this. And you should have noticed this, because we've chanted this Metta Sutta twice a day. Have you listened to it? <laughs> Whatever living beings they may be, omitting nuns, <laughs> <laughs> let none deceive another, or despise anything in any state. Let none, through anger or ill will, wish harm upon another. <laughs> That's the answer. <laughs> you know, we did that, I think, last retreat, and people just chanted. They said, let monks, through anger or ill will, <laughs> Just to make it fair. <coughs> Could you please give a clear definition of pāna or life as referred to in the first precept? How small is the smallest size of life? Is Sankara's defining factor for life in this context? Now actually, it's for the monk's rule, they say if you can't see it, if it's that small you can't see, then you, know, you can't really intentionally be killing it. So if it's like a bacteria in your tummy, you can take the antibiotics. You know, you, you may have sort of a bacteria and think, oh my goodness, I'm a Buddhist. I've got to let this, you know, <laughs> this disease just kill me. You know, it's either me or the disease. No, if you can't see it, you know, bacteria, virus and stuff, yeah, you can kill those things. Even like they say if it's fungus on the walls, that's just, you know, too small. But if it's like an ant, yeah, you know, it's not, not supposed to kill the ant. I'm not supposed to kill the mosquito, poor mosquitoes. Only take a tiny little bit of blood. Okay, it's not much. I let it take something. You've got plenty. <laughs> so that's actually the, where the, the limit goes. If you can't see it, then it's not under the, um, not under the, um, uh, the first precept. So if you have a mosquito on you, <coughs> take off your glasses. Well, I can't see what I'm... <laughs> No, don't do that, I was only joking. <laughs> I could get into big trouble. So that's fine. Dear Ajahn Brahm, we live in the past, dream into the future. Please explain living in the present moment. Example, could our mind wander at the present moment? Wander with W-O, Andy. 
Yeah, it is. I mean, we live too much in the past. And you know, all your pasts are fantasies. We always think, no, 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 I know what I did in the past. No, you don't. You imagine you know what you did in the past. But the truth of the matter is totally different. There was a nice little psychology um, article I read years ago. There was a psychologist who was about to retire in Canada and he was cleaning out all his old papers and he got a research paper he did about 40 years ago when he was at university where he interviewed all these young people about their life at home. Now 40 years ago, and this was actually the United States, now, very simple yes or no questions. Did you love your mother more than your father? You know, if you did something wrong, did they ground you or spank you? What did they do? Did they give you pocket money or did they not give you pocket money? And he had all their answers and he had this great idea. Let's find as many of these students, you know, now probably you know, very old or close to retirement or retired as possible, and ask them the same questions and compare the answers. They're simple things. Did your mother give you pocket money or not? And he was amazed just how many people put down totally opposite of what they said 40 years ago. Basically, what they thought happened was against what they said when it was happening. The memory is just totally unreliable. So you think what happened when you were young, but I guarantee it's not what happened. It's a fantasy. You've made it up. We make up the past. And you think, okay, I make up, make, make up a little bit of the past, but you make up more of the past than you'd ever imagine. If I could actually show you your past again, you'd be so surprised it's not what I thought it was. Now that really shows you what a waste of time it is, thinking of the past. It's like a fantasy, like a dream. And how much more is the future a fantasy of your dream? Now, 20 years ago, did you ever think you'd be spending your holidays here? You know, with one, two meals a day, nothing to eat in the evening, no movies, and just meditating all day, getting a sore bum, and listening to the same old jokes every evening. Did you ever think you're going to do this? <laughs> but here you are now. The future is just a series of unexpected events which you can never predict. That's why... If you want to plan at all, maybe one or two days into the future, but more than that, you just can't plan. You don't know what's going to happen. So that's why we, we live in fantasy world. The past is a fantasy. The future is a fantasy too. So, get real. As I say to you, get a life. Some people say to me, you know, get a life, Ajahn Brahm. Yes, I've got one. Do you want one? So that way that you can actually be here. And you find life is much more fun being here, it's real, rather than fantasy. For the Sutta classes, which recordings are available on Dhamma Loka website, is it possible to upload also the handouts so that it's easy to follow the classes? Thank you. No, the handouts, they are just printouts of the books which are available in the library. So don't be such a cheapskate, buy the books. <laughs> Instead of just trying to get them for free off the internet, oh, you just stingy lot. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, you can get those suitors online anyway. So, you now these are just from the books, so you can get them from there. Dear Ajahn, why did your teacher, Ajahn Chah, prefer to define anicca as uncertain rather than as an impermanent? Thanks. Because that's another meaning of it. Now, one of the great things being a monk, you have this time and you're encouraged to learn this ancient language of Pali. And the best way of learning it is actually to read it and see how words are used in different contexts by ordinary people. Now, you've got a word like Nibbana or Nirvana. And I was just stunned when I was reading that just an ordinary episode of people in a house in India at that time, they had a little oil lamp and the oil lamp went out. What was the word they used? It nibbanad. And for me that means this is what the word means. It was not some metaphysical, philosophical word which only people in universities understood. Every kid in the time of the Buddha would know what that word meant. It was what happened when a flame went out. 
And that gives you an understanding of what the word means in Buddhism. And when it comes to anicca, I was reading the monks' rules and they had this type of food offering called nicha, which is the opposite of anicca, nicha food. And nicha food is the food people bring every week, maybe on a Monday. You know, just going to a um, monastery this morning to have my lunch, there's people who have been bringing food every Monday for years, the same people. And this is their day, they always come on Monday. And there's another group of people who always come on Tuesday. Some people keep come on the weekend regularly. That is called regular food. And the opposite of that is anicca, irregular. That's what it really means. Something there, which is always there, coming, and now it's stopped. It's uncertain, irregular. And it gives you a much deeper meaning than this word impermanent. It's a much deeper word than that. So when you see it's just disappeared, irregular, or uncertain, that gives a much, much broader meaning. So you say the future is impermanent. What does that mean? It changes. We all know it changes. But to say it's uncertain, now that is a far more profound saying. The future is uncertain. Or even the present, you know, we try and control it, but we can't. That's why it's uncertain. Your memories of the past, uncertain. What that means is you can't attach to things. They change. You let go. So your bank balance is uncertain. You don't know what your bank's doing with it. <laughs> anyway. Why do we need to meditate with the earth, fire, water, wind, air elements, things? And what about skin, bone, hair? Are these another type of meditation from the time of the Buddha? This was just old ways of looking at the things which constitute matter. Being a theoretical physicist, I couldn't really understand much of this because two of these things were totally the same. We've moved on since then, but all it was saying that now this stuff you know, which we, which we assume to be solid. It is not solid, it's just things coming together. That's all this stuff really is. So, you know, you, you think of, say, even I was just talking about money. What is money anyway? It's just a value people give onto this stuff. It's just, you know, it's metal, that's all. And it's got something printed on it. It's notes, that's all. And I remember my teacher, Ajahn Chah, he said, he made a prediction, he said, one day, Governments will run out of metal to make coins. And they'll also run out of paper to make banknotes. So he said, what they will probably use for currency is these little balls, these little pellets of chicken shit. And people will be so proud that they've got more chicken shit than anybody else. And they'll go around stealing other people's chicken shit. And they go around their pockets full of chicken shit and thinking how wealthy they are. I've got more chicken shit than you have. Na 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 na. <laughs> and the IMF will be called the International Manure Fund. <laughs> and there'll be big banks with vaults of chicken shit. <laughs> and burglars will be trying to break in to steal chicken shit as much as they possibly can. So what's the difference between chicken shit and, and money? Just the value we put on it. And he really got into this. It was very funny. He had all this you know, laughing. Because what a great sort of simile that is. <laughs> What's the difference anyway? It's just what the value you give onto it. So this is you know, all this stuff, the earth, air, fire and water, you know, just stuff. We just give it value. We think it's valuable. You know, diamonds. What are diamonds? are just rocks, that's all. Just bits of carbon which has been compressed. And you know, it's just a value you give on them. Apparently the, the diamond producers, especially De Beers, the most important thing they ever did was marketing. Because you know, diamonds have got no intrinsic value. Okay, they may be useful for cutting things, but you know, they're not that beautiful if you really look at them. Just a bit of a rock, that's all. But they've convinced you that it's really valuable and really nice, and it's convinced all the girls that diamonds are a girl's best friend. And you, you've, you got sucked into the advertising campaign. And your poor husbands, if they're rich, they have to go and buy these stupid things for you. They're in rocks in the ground. And it reminds me of my second joke this evening. It was Valentine's Day, or the day before Valentine's Day. And 
uh, husband asked his dear wife, he said, darling, what can I get you for Valentine's Day? And the wife said, no, I don't need anything. You don't need to buy me anything. But this was a smart man. When your wife says that, that's not what she means. <laughs> she wants something. So no, no, come on, I'll get you something special. What do you want? And the wife said, something with diamonds in. Anything with diamonds will do. So the next day when she opened her gift, she found a pack of playing cards. <laughs> 13 diamonds, what did she want? <laughs> what about skin, bone and hair? That's just, uh, we do those things. We, this is actually mostly for, for novices. They have these five meditations when they first become novices of reflecting on the five external parts of the body. Hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth and skin. Because that's what I see when I look at each one of you. you know, other stuff is hidden. This is the outside of a human body. And the reason why we reflect on this is because we reflect the hair of your head. What I see is all dead stuff. Because the root of the hair, the live part, is actually underneath. Same as like hair of the, the body, if there's a moustache there or something, that's all dead. You know, because the life is underneath. And nails and teeth as well. The live part of a nail, you can't see, you only see the dead part. Same as the teeth, the roots are underneath. And even the skin, what you see, is a dead stuff. You've got to go maybe, what is it, a millimetre, two millimetres underneath where you get the live part of the skin. So we tell the monks who just, you know, these young men who just uh, become novices for the first time, still got lots of lust. If you see, say, Kate Moss come in, or Angelina Jolie, or whoever else you think is a hot chick, she starts to come in here. What are you seeing? A beautiful hair. And that's all dead stuff. <laughs> who, wants to, who wants to touch and stroke dead stuff? But beautiful cons complexion. That's dead stuff. Who want to kiss dead stuff? Oh, that's sick. <laughs> <laughs> so it just stops your lust straight away. So you know, all I'm seeing here is dead stuff in front of me. And you see here, this is all dead stuff as well. So what it just it looks at life in a different way. So you just don't worry about this stuff. Actually, on Kate Moss, no, no, this is, this is a real story, this is not the joke story, that she went on a retreat, a meditation retreat, with I think someone from Perth. And this guy you know, who comes to Perth said he was amazed. He was told that Kate Moss, this supermodel, was on a meditation retreat with him. And he looked around, you know, as you would, now, which one is Kate Moss? And he couldn't pick her out. Because in real life, she just looks like every other girl. It's only that when the makeup, when the hair, the lights, the airbrushing, she's just like you know, one of these, these faces where they can make anything out of. But in real life, she's not beautiful. It's just made up. It's a fantasy. It's marketing. That's all it is. And they were so amazed actually to see that. They didn't know who it was. And so all this thing about beauty and sexual attraction, it's just all made up, that's all. But we like to have it made up. That is why we like fantasies and romance. If you like romance, don't come near me. I am the most unromantic monk you can possibly imagine because I know, I told him one of my books, you know, when you, if you do want romance, if you want to go out for a romantic dinner, you know, with the person you like and love, you go, you go to a candlelit restaurant. What's another romantic place, you know, a walk under the moonlight, isn't that romantic? Or even like a nightclub. You know what those three venues all share in common? They're all dark. Because when it's dark, you can't really see what you're falling in love with. In the candlelight, you're that weedy, thin, uh, old man, looks like Brad Pitt. <laughs> <laughs> that plain old girl, she does look like Scarlett Johansson in the moonlight. Because the darkness gives your, your delusion free reign to make up of this ordinary person just you know, this 
gorgeous, perfect person which you always wanted. That's why if you want romance, never go out with your boyfriend or girlfriend in the middle of the day. <laughs> you see all their defects and you won't fall in love. That's why they have candlelit dinners and nightclubs. Dark. Then you can fall in love. <laughs> I have a bad habit of sulking when I don't get my own way. It causes problems with my wife and she hates it. What can I do? Well, share with your wife. Tell her how to sulk too. So at least you can sulk together. <laughs> you can't get your own way in this life. I can't get my own way, so I just give up. Just let it go. So stop sulking when you don't get your own way. Because when you don't get your own way, that's teaching you something. Now you're teaching you this beautiful the meaning of life. That you're out of control, you don't get your own way. So the secret of a happy marriage is actually, you know, this is this was an author, what was his name? I forget now, but anyway, the secret of a happy marriage is if you are right, shut up. Don't say you're right, because that really, really gets up the you know what of your partner. If you're wrong, admit it. So you know, when you you go and get your own way, sort of admit it. I didn't get my own way, darling. And then there's no problems at all. I remember this other uh, marriage. It was really amazing. They were just so happy together, this couple. And when he asked the guy, you know, he was actually interviewed, I think, in a newspaper. And he said, I haven't argued with my wife since the day we got married. For 20, 30 years they've been together. No arguments at all. He said, how did that happen? And he said, oh, because when I went for my, our honeymoon, we did our honeymoon in the Grand Canyon. Many people go honeymoon in that place. And as they were riding down one of the canyons on a path on a donkey, so my wife's donkey tripped. And my wife, my wife told this donkey, that's the first time. I didn't know what she was doing. But then a couple of minutes later, the donkey stumbled again. And my wife looked at this donkey really sternly and told the donkey, that's the second time. And the donkey stumbled a third time. And my wife didn't even talk to the donkey, she just got out a gun and shot it dead. <laughs> and I asked my wife, what did you do that for? And my wife said, that's the first time. <laughs> And we haven't had an argument since. <laughs> that's the way, don't sulk. <laughs> Just tell your wife, that's the first time. <laughs> Please advise, I used to enjoy good morning meditation at home until I came to Jhana Grove. Oops. The cold air is affecting my morning meditation, even my sleep. Should I just change object by focusing instead on the feeling arising due to the cold until I disappear? Or should I just enjoy the cold and ignore it until I disappear? Meanwhile, my nose is dripping water. <laughs> okay, so first of all, bung something up your nose. You know, stuff it up so it doesn't drip. Or I meditate upside down so it doesn't drip out, it drips back in again. <laughs> oh, no, look, please, you've got heaters in your room. You know what the heaters are for? <laughs> They're not just there as, as you know, fashion accessories for your room. But if you're cold, turn them on. Warm yourself up. So you have at least one room which is like, you know, where you're ever from, Malaysian sort of uh, temperature or whatever else you're from, or you know, Sri Lankan temperature. You can turn the, the heater on and have it nice and cosy in there. And you don't have to meditate here, meditate in your room where it's nice and warm, just the temperature which you like. So I don't know why it is, we, we spent a lot of money with these heaters. So use them for goodness sake, if you're cold. And you know, if you're worried about the cost, get all the other people who are cold, all in your room, and they can all sit together and just <laughs> sweat. Or use the blankets, but the heaters are the best. So that's what you can do. So don't just sit there, just do something. You said contemplation and thinking are all the same, just don't do it. 
if I were to attain a certain degree of stillness and come out from it, and if I don't do some contemplation on what the Buddha meant by dukkha anicca anatta, how could I ever be enlightened? Can wisdom just arise without any contemplation? It arises without you doing anything. One of the great teachings of the Buddha was that he was saying that, you know, once say you know you're happy, you don't have to think, oh, may I become still. It happens naturally. Once you are still, you don't have to make the decision, oh, may I see things as they truly are. It will happen as a natural course. And if you see things as they truly are, you don't have to make the desire, the wish, oh, may I become enlightened. It happens naturally. It's one of the great teachings of the Buddha, that it's a natural process. So you don't have to go out doing things. You just sit there and all the enlightenment comes to you. Don't shake the tree. Just open up your, your mind and all the mangoes will fall into it. Now Anicca Dukkanatta will be obvious to you. you. Okay, so you don't need to contemplate. I am a psychotherapist and I suffer from depression. What, what, what are you doing teaching other people for if you can't get out of it yourself? Okay. I, can't, I see lots of people with problems. Okay, serious. I see lots of people with problems and I can't let go of their misery. Have you any suggestions? Yeah. This is sometimes, apparently, um, the people with the most depression and suicide are dentists. You know, spending all their time in other people's smelly mouths. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, it is a very tough, tough job. But nevertheless, you know, psychotherapists or counsellors, you're dealing with people's problems all day. And this was the advice of my teacher, Ajahn Chah, and it's absolutely brilliant advice. If you're a psychotherapist or a counsellor or a monk or a nun, people always come up to tell you their problems. And you have to accept those problems out of compassion. You have to be what Ajahn Chah says, a rubbish bin, a trash can. And everybody throws their rubbish inside of you. So rubbish, throw it here. But you have to be a trash can, a rubbish bin, with a hole in the bottom. So everybody throws things in, but it goes right through and you keep nothing. You're always empty for your next client. That is the trick. Out of compassion to listen to people to empathise with them, not to feel their pain. But as soon as they leave the room, it goes right out of you. So you're empty and ready for the next person. And you never take anything home with you. The trash can simile. Such a beautiful thing. And you're doing that out of kindness to yourself and kindness for the next person who's going to come into your rooms. And that way you never get depressed. You don't need to get depressed. So, and also you find out that all the problems of life, this is another one of my favourite story, I've told it too many times, you know, the shit and the mango, I told it earlier on. You know, all the problems, they're telling all these, you know, the dog shit of their lives. But if you just think of it as dog shit, it just will depress you. Think of it as potential mangoes. And then when you see it that way, all the problems of their life, this is where they're growing from. This is the stuff of life. This is the important things. It's amazing, wonderful. Thank you for telling me this incredible story. And then actually it doesn't become depressing anymore. It's only depressing when you only see half of the process, the beginning, and you don't realise how this all works out into the big picture of growth. Winter is the most depressing time in the Northern Hemisphere. If you don't remember that under the ground there are so many seeds of incredible flowers just waiting for the first warmth of the spring. You see all those trees and they look like some battlefield with no green on them at all in the Northern Hemisphere. All the leaves have fallen off. But you know inside those branches there's life dormant just waiting to come out with incredible, beautiful green foliage and blossoms. It's all waiting there. Potential life. 
So when you see someone in the winter of their life going through incredible pain and suffering, the spring is in there somewhere. That's the job of a therapist, to bring that out. And if you understand that and see that too, it's not depressing anymore. The winter is just life waiting. It's a nice way of looking at it. So that way you don't get depressed. Do we, know, do we need to know Amitabha or chant Amitabha? I don't know Amitabha, I don't chant Amitabha, so if I don't need it, you don't. Amitabha is just supposed to be the name of a future Buddha, but what it really means is unlimited radiance. So you know when you can experience unlimited radiance? Beautiful nimittas. That is Amitabha. Unme Ami Amita means unmeasured. You know what I was saying before about not measuring? An arbor is radiance. The radiance which comes from a mind which doesn't judge. So you can know that inside yourself. What should a Buddhist, what response should the Buddhists give when we encounter an unseen being, like a ghost? I used to chant loving kindness if I feel them around. My mother has the ability to see and hear them. She told me many stories. Some of the ghosts don't interact, but some do. For example, switch on the TV, open a cupboard at night, play music box, etc., to let people know they are around. Why don't I, can they get reincarnated rather than stay around us? If you encounter a ghost, if a real ghost, not just an imaginary one, don't chase them away. Because ghosts have got all sorts of powers. Like they can tell you the winning lottery numbers. <laughs> so if a ghost comes into your room, don't run away. Say, just hold on a minute before you run away. <laughs> Give me some lottery numbers and then you can chase them away. Or there's a certain lady who you know very well. She's not here this evening, but you'll see her tomorrow. And her husband told me how he got the first boost up in life. She was a simple school teacher. He was a labourer on a building site. And, and this is in Perth, <laughs> and you know, just hardly any money, you know, but they were sort of you know, loved each other and tried to start a life together. But how do you get the start, you know, to get your first house? So he was on this building site, renovating an old house somewhere in central Perth, and he was the last man on the job. All the rest had gone home, and he was walking past a part of the house when he heard someone speak. Put your hand under here. And he looked around, there's no one around, but he heard it very clearly, he wondered, what's going on? And he heard it again, really clearly. Put your hand under here. So he had the guts to put his hand under the house where he heard this sound and he drew out a tin box and that box was full of cash, thousands of dollars, which he used to buy his first house to get started in life. Because the previous owner, you know, instead of paying tax, he hid all his cash under the house and died. And now he's dead, he can't use it. And he wanted to make sure this money was used for somebody who really needed it. What a wonderful true story that is. So if ever you're passing an old building <laughs> and you hear the sound, put your hand under here, put your hand under here, don't run away. It could be a tin box full of cash under there. But please remember, I told you that story. So at least 10% goes to Buddhist. <laughs> well, so that's what you should do when you encounter unseen beings. They're quite cute. Some people say if awareness of breath is placed on a certain point, top of the nose, then nimitta will become clearer and more obvious. Is it true? Say if awareness of breath is placed onto the overall feeling of lung, will the nimitta be clear as well? 
That nimitta arises when your body vanishes. So if you focus on any part of your body, it just keeps you attached to your body. It is much better just to let the nimitta come up naturally when the body vanishes. So I actually say no, it's much better to let go of the body as soon as possible. So nimitta is much clearer when the body has disappeared. So you're not watching the breath anywhere. Why did you become a monk? <laughs> I can't remember. I know it was something important. <laughs> now why did I... I always... I told you yesterday, or the day before. Because of a broken heart. <laughs> <laughs> and I became a monk to forget. And I've forgotten. So it must be right, it's consistent. <laughs> now I became a monk, this is a serious business, because I was a Buddhist, and in our tradition, you can become a monk for however long you want. There's no such thing as life vows. So if you're not enjoying it, you disrobe, you leave. And you are respected for that, the very fact you became a monk for so long, well done. So it's not a shame, you don't sort of think you know, you're a failed person because you didn't make it. No, it's a wonderful thing you did that. And so I heard this, in time you can become a monk just for however long you want. And I just again finished with one relationship, had a good job. I thought this is a great opportunity to spend one or two years of my life as a Buddhist monk and really get into it. And it really was just thinking one or two years. I told my mum, I told the headmaster of the school where I was teaching, I said, I'll probably come back. He said, I'll keep your job for you, you're a good teacher. And they kept it for me. But of course, as soon as I became a monk, I liked it so much and never left. But you always had that opportunity to leave whenever you wanted. So it was a wonderful thing. And now we have that for nuns as well. Just give it a try, see if it fits you. And so you have the opportunity now, which is brilliant. Given your following and worldwide commitments, how do you keep check of the ego? I get cheap check of the ego by helping all the other monks, you know, do all the work and stuff like that over at um, Bodhinyana Monastery. But you know that, <laughs> this is a serious thing, that I remember once going into Singapore, it was a big talk I was giving in the uh, Suntec City Convention Centre. And 5,000 people were sitting in this huge auditorium and just me, no supporting act, nobody else, no MC, just me sitting on a chair facing 5,000 people. And I thought at that time, the only way I can do this if I have no ego. If you have an ego there, you'll get nervous, you'll get proud and you'll really stuff up. So it's only when you can really let go that you can actually do things like that. Otherwise it just doesn't work. So that is the only way you can get such a big following, by letting go of your ego. Otherwise you find it just does not work, it's just too much stress. And you know I'm just pretty relaxed, look at me, everything falls off. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't care what you think of me. And that was a wonderful thing that giving a talk, if you like it, great, if you don't like it, that's even better. Which means I can have a nice easy life, don't have to go so many places. So that's actually how you, you do it. And you don't measure yourself. I don't care what other people say. There's enough people who call me a fool, and enough people say, oh, you're the most amazing thing since the Buddha. Do I believe any of them? No way. So don't allow yourself to be judged. And then you can do whatever you like. It becomes good fun then. You know one of the most scary things to do, apparently, and they say tea talking in public is a scary thing to do, but even more scary than that is supposed to be talking on live TV. You know, when it's being streamed over so many people and they're all watching you, waiting for you to pick your nose. <laughs> <laughs> and I figured out the only way to do that is just to have fun. So if ever I'm on live TV, I'm just messing around. I'm not being serious at all. Because when you're having fun, you can't be afraid. When you're actually telling jokes, your ego vanishes because everybody laughs with you. That's one of the things I learned as a school teacher. If you make a mistake and people start laughing, you laugh as well. Then the world never laughs at you, it only laughs with you. 
And that's where your ego vanishes. I followed your instructions to count the breath, but my active brain seems to be multitasking when it is counting the breath. It goes round and round of thinking how to stop this grief. Why do you want to multitask for? This is supposed to be relaxing. Okay, so if you're multitasking, what you should do, you should watch your breath and also reflect on the qualities of the Buddha and contemplate on the five parts of the body <laughs> and contemplate on, on vipassana as well as samatha at the same time. That's where you can multitask. And if you're multitasking, <laughs> this is absolutely crazy. If you multi <laughs> no, come on, just keep it simple. The only reason you multitask is because you're bored with counting the breath. When you are, say, watching a movie at home, do you multitask? If you're, those of you who like soccer or like cricket, or you're watching a, the sport, you know, Sri Lanka are playing cricket, are you multitasking? No way, you're just watching. If you're really enjoying something, you can't multitask. So the trick is, put some more joy in watching the breath, for goodness sake. So, I've never taught this yet. We have all these skillful means of putting joy into watching the breath. So, if the counting doesn't work, you can do uh, what we call backwards breath meditation. And to do backwards breath meditation, I'm now going to teach you backwards breath meditation, discovered here in Jhana Grove only a few years ago. And now just to do this, first of all, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and breathe in and out three times. Okay? So close your eyes, breathe in and out three times. And then after the third breath, open your eyes and please carry on breathing with your eyes open. <laughs> so breathe in and out three times. Okay? Now I guarantee that you started off with an in-breath and then out. In, out, in, out. Now, the same instruction, when I say go, close your eyes, but breathe out first and then in. Out, in, out, in. Three times. Okay, go. And then open your eyes after the third in breath. You will find that's totally different than breathing in first. So I call that Backwards breath meditation. You breathe out first and then in. Out and then in. It shouldn't be different, but my goodness, it is. So if you're watching your breath every now and again, do backwards breath meditation. Watch the out breath first and then the in breath. And you find, amazing, I can be more aware because this is different. And if that doesn't work, you can try three in breaths to one out breath meditation. <laughs> <laughs> because when you play around, you'll find you're more aware and you won't multitask and meditation becomes a bit of fun. Now, this yesterday evening I talked about walking meditation and I've only told one person because Buddhism has to adapt to a local culture. It always does that. And so, how to adapt walking meditation to Australian culture? We have developed the kangaroo <laughs> method of walking meditation. So if you really get dull and depressed, and nothing's working for the, you, this actually works, 100% guarantee, if you actually do it. It'll wake you up, bring you happiness, and you'll find you can be much more mindful afterwards. Start in one of the rooms over there, at the end of the, the, uh, the path, and don't just put your hands in the front like this, or folded. You have to put your hands like kangaroo, in front of you like this. And don't just walk, you know, left foot, right foot, because kangaroos don't walk. They jump. So jump, mindfully, to the very end of the path. And then turn around, and then hop back again. That's called kangaroo walking meditation developed in Australia for Australian Buddhists. <laughs> <laughs> now try that. Now seriously, I want every one of you at least to do backwards and forwards, at least once. Unless you've got sort of bad knees or something, it's going to cripple you. Try it. 
because it will wake you up, it will make everybody else in the room laugh, <laughs> you're creating happiness out of great compassion, and you don't get bored anymore, and you don't get mind wandering all over the place, you're making it fun. Now have you been multitasking since I've been talking to you this evening? I made it fun and joyful, so you're paying attention. That is the secret of attention. Making it fun, so you can do kangaroo <laughs> walking meditation, it's good fun. When we say, none of my business, I feel like there is something like me, separate from this body and mind, and what happens to this body and mind is not my business. Please give me advice, thank you. I'm not going to give you advice. He says, give me advice. No, because I'm not going to give you advice, because it's none of my business. <laughs> <laughs> no, stop making it it's complicated. So you're saying, it's none of my business, and then you realise there's a me in there, so me is nothing, none of my business either. So see how far you can actually adapt, none of my business. Thinking like that is none of your business either. So you have no business at all. When you have no business at all, not even with me, then me disappears, and then you can be peaceful. So just you haven't applied none of my business deep enough. In the driverless bus simile, which is in the book, the person who sees a driver's seat is empty, comes back to his seat and sits still, not wanting anything. What does this person who sits still afterwards? Does this person mean the eye concept with unaligned people have in mind? Now all it is, is just a process of this thing we call the mind. This is when you realise there's no driver, the thing you take to be will is not you at all, it's just an empty process, which means that there's no one driving the bus called you. It's a driverless bus. So when you realise there's no one driving this bus, you can't complain. How many of you get really upset when you make a mistake? How many of you think, yes, I had a good meditation, I'm great. There's no one driving the bus, there's no one to praise, there's no one to blame. Isn't that wonderful? Then I've got no one to improve, nothing to do. You can at last be free. So when you see there's no one driving your bus, there's no one to complain to anymore. There's no anger left, there's no guilt, there's no praise, there's no desire. You just sit there and enjoy the journey. Not being a control freak, because there's nothing doing the controlling. Oh, what bliss! To see Ajahn Brahm is not there. Isn't it simply so that it. Oh, oh my goodness. Isn't it simply so that if it isn't simple, it simply isn't? That's too complicated for me. <laughs> That's quite smart, though. I have a bad back and other physical problems, but I am too scared to have them looked at. I block my own health, what should I do? Oh, well, it depends on how, how your back is. Don't call it a bad back. You think, bad back, you bad back, you've done something wrong. <laughs> Don't ever call this bad. This is why I say, if you ever go to a doctor, this is one of the reasons why you get scared. If you go to a doctor, how many times do you tell the doctor, doctor, there's something, wrong with me. There's nothing wrong with you, it's all right to be sick. I give you permission to be sick. It is not evil, it's not against any precepts or any moral code of any religion that says thou shalt be healthy. No, you're allowed to be sick, it is your right, your human right to be sick. So when you go and see the doctor next time, you should tell that doctor, doctor, there is something right with me. I'm sick again. Why do you call it something wrong with you or something bad? That gives this negative stigma to sickness, which means you're ashamed of being sick. That happened to me once. I think it was, oh no, well, I didn't have a bad back. I was just, we'd never really found out what it was. I lost all my energy. And I went to go and see the doctor in Byford, close here. And I was sitting in the room, waiting for the appointment, and this guy came in, he was actually one of the prison officers at Carnet up the road, I was teaching there every week, and he looked at me and said, I never expected to see you in here. And I felt so guilty, like, you know, they found me in a brothel or, you know, in a <laughs> pub or something. I said, what am I doing wrong? You know, because he thought you were meditator, live a nice lifestyle, I shouldn't get sick. 
And I think, what else is wrong with being sick? I'm allowed to be sick just because I'm a monk. You, know, you can be sick just because you're a vegetarian and do yoga, you're still allowed to be sick. <laughs> but sometimes there's such a stigma about being sick, which is one of the reasons why we say there's something wrong with me. And because we think it's wrong, we think it's bad, we think I'm a failure, I'm sick, I should have been looking after my health, I'm such a bad monk, we're eating all the wrong foods, not exercising enough, it's my fault, I'm costing this government a lot of money being sick, taking up the doctor's time when you could be healing someone much more important than me, oh, I feel terrible, I feel depressed. There's nothing wrong with being sick. In fact, sick people have rights to. So when you are sick, Please remember, you're giving other people this wonderful opportunity to make good karma. So if you're at home, tell your husband, darling, I'm sick, this is your opportunity to make good karma. Look after me. Because <laughs> we do look like looking after other people. It's a wonderful thing to look after someone who's sick. You get so much happiness out of that. The thing is, we don't have enough sick people to look after these days. They're all so damn independent. Nothing wrong with me, I can do it by myself. Now let me pamper you, because it's nice to pamper other people. So anyway, if you are sick, have a bad back. You haven't got a bad back, you've got a good back. Stop being so hard on your back. You've got a good back, it just happens to be hurting. So that way, you can have them looked at if you like, but a lot of times you change your attitude, a lot of health problems disappear with good attitude. So anyway. Dear Ajahn Brahm, you are reconditioning us. Yes. Ajahn Chah reconditioned you. Yes. Ajahn Chah's teacher reconditioned him. Buddha reconditioned his disciple. Then what reconditioned the Buddha to his enlightenment? He was a monk under the former Buddha, Kasapa. So he was a former Buddha. You don't just have one Buddha. Even Buddhas get you know, one after the other. Everything goes round and round in Buddhism. You know, you just you know these jokes, these stories go round and round. <laughs> Always get reincarnated after on every retreat. What do you expect? It's reincarnation. The story I told last week gets reincarnated again today. You know, even the food you have tomorrow, you know, Bianca will be reincarnating it, what was left over for tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, we've had many Buddhas, endless Buddhas. It can happen once, it can happen twice. Even universes get reincarnated. Series of big bangs goes on forever. It's beautiful, you know, this endless time. This is just the, the one big bang we know. So the Buddha talked about 93 big bangs. Amazing. So, you know, universes get reincarnated, they keep going on Buddhas. So the Buddha got his conditioning from Kasapa the Buddha. And where did Kasapa the Buddha get his conditioning from? You realize it from the Buddha before. And it goes back, 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 endlessly. Isn't that nice? What's the difference between the two statements? Everything is conditioned and everything has been determined to happen as it happens by earlier causes. Ah, it's not determined to happen because we've got something in science called chaos theory. Which means even though you have all the conditions, you never realize how it's going to actually work out. Because it is so finely balanced, a tiny uh, move to the left changes the whole world. A tiny move to the right, we just, on a knife edge, that's what it says when a butterfly flaps its wings over Peking. There's a cyclone over the Philippines. That cyclone in the Philippines, that was from a butterfly over Peking. That's what they say in chaos theory. So this is actually, you can't really predict, but everything has its causes, but without being determined. It's a beautiful third way, in between. It's not fatalistic. No, no, no way do you know what's going to happen. But everything has its causes. The middle way between. Da, da, da. So don't go thinking about that, otherwise you won't sleep tonight. People love thinking about things. Could you please comment on the report that some people are born with the ability to see people's aura? Who wants to see your aura anyway? <laughs> Is it really interesting? Much better if they can see what you're thinking about, if they can read your mind. If you could read people's mind, would you do it? <laughs> You do one or two and then think, oh, this is really boring. Who wants to read that mind? It's like reading a bad book. Have you ever picked up a novel and it's just so much rubbish? Now you know what it's like if you can read people's minds. You just read one or two and that's it. You don't want to waste your time any, anymore. 
If it's a really good mind, that's really worth reading, like a good book, but they're very rare these days. This morning you talked about breathing in health and out cancer or anything else you want to let go, but aren't we supposed to let these things be? Is there a difference between letting go and letting be? And it doesn't de depend on the situation. Thanks with Meta. Now if you've got cancer or something, you don't just let it be, you're compassionate, you do something about it. If I broke my leg this <coughs> evening, I wouldn't think, oh, just let it be. It is my calm to have to have a broken leg, so don't call the ambulance, just let it be. So no desire, I'm just going to have a broken leg, okay. No way, call the ambulance. Because that's compassion and kindness, which is part of letting be. Opening the door of your heart and doing what needs to be done. So when all of your anger, ill will, desire and guilt, grief, you become common sense out of kindness. Because all these doctors, they need to make more good karma. And here's my broken leg. You can make lots of good karma out of this. So, off you go. Body is in the mind. What happens to the mind when the body dies? Again, the mind carries on. The body's just dead, that's all. What happens to you when your car dies? Do you die as well? Do you go to, when, when you trade it in, do you get traded in as well? And they look at the car and they say, give a thousand bucks for that, and the driver, you know, five bucks. <laughs> can, their body, can there be a body without the mind? Of course they can, it's called a corpse. It's <laughs> <laughs> an obvious answer, come on. What is the mind doing when a person is declared brain dead? A lot of times they're looking on. They're saying, oh, they just said I'm brain dead, that's really interesting. So that's what happens. Was I, I told that story about one of the guys, actually I haven't seen him for a while, I'm not sure what he's up to. But this was a story, okay I can do this, I've got a few minutes. He was one of our meditators. It was one Sunday afternoon. He was meditating at home in a suburb of Perth. And he usually meditates for 45 minutes, maybe half an hour, 45 max. And he told his wife, I'm just going into my bedroom to meditate. Maybe an hour and a half afterwards, he hadn't come out yet. So his wife went to go and check on him. And there he was in his bedroom, sitting perfectly still. When I said perfectly still, I really meant perfectly still. He wasn't breathing. She looked at him, there was no breath coming in or going out. So she rang zero, zero, zero to get the ambulance. My, my husband must have had a heart attack. And within five minutes, the ambulance turned up. Do, 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 do. Right outside the door with the lights flashing, the medics ran in. They took his pulse. There was no pulse. They put him in the, in the stretcher, put him in the back of the ambulance with the wife there, running through every red light. Do, 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 do. Right through into Sir Charles Gardner Hospital, the main hospital here, straight into the emergency room. This was an emergency, life or death. He wasn't breathing, there was no pulse. They put him in the emergency room with all of the, the, the stuff all over him, the ECG first of all, on his heart. The monitor showed a flat line. Ding, 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 emergency. Apparently, it doesn't go ding, 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 emergency, which is really disappointing because it takes away a lot of my story. <laughs> There's a flat line. They put an EG e on his brain. Another flat line. Cardiac arrest and brain dead through meditating. Be careful. <laughs> <laughs> Now, it was such good luck that the doctor on duty, the intern, was an Indian guy. And in, in India, in many other places in Southeast Asia, they know that through meditation you can actually do this. You can suspend all your life activities, like the heart and the breathing. So he had heard this from his father. So he thought, you know, my wife said he was meditating. Maybe he's in one of these states. So he did not send him down to the morgue straight away. I always thought that was so lucky they never sent him down the morgue. Because he was only meditating, he came out later on. Imagine, you know, you're down there in the morgue, dead stiff, and suddenly you open up your eyes and say, hi guys, 
You know, the poor attendants, they'll be the one who's dead next. <laughs> it does happen. But you know, this, most times people in a coma or engine, they come out slowly, they just start moving, and then the morgue attendants, they take them up again to get them revived. But this guy, who just came out straight away eventually. But anyway, they put on defibrillators, you know, to, to try and get the heart going again. Apparently his wife said many, many times, they didn't say, I can't remember how long, they really tried his defibrillators, nothing worked. He was dead. What they thought anyway. And then he decided, he said, I said, he decided now's the time to come out of my meditation. And as he opened his eyes, and as soon as he opened his eyes, beep, 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 all the menotors were perfect. And he said, well, what am I doing here? I was, I was in my room, in home, what am I doing here? And you know, they explained what had happened to him, and he was absolutely perfect. The doctor gave him a thorough checkup, could find nothing wrong with him at all, so he just walked home with his wife. <laughs> what a great story that is. A real story. All the time he was having the time of his life, he said, so much bliss, never enjoyed myself so much ever. Deep inside. And that can be what happens when the body looks dead, but the mind is perfectly okay, having a very happy time. And don't worry about this, because sometimes people say, what if that happens to me? You know, maybe I'm not so lucky, maybe they take me off there and they do bury me or they cremate me. Uh, I'm only meditating. Ah! Don't worry. Because that happened in the time of the Buddha. In one of the sutras, they tell the story of this monk who's meditating in a forest and he was getting into one of these deep meditations where he got absolutely still. A couple of villagers, they were getting some herbs or something from the forest. They came across this monk and they thought he was dead. And they were actually Buddhists and they thought, it's not right that we let this monk be eaten by the jungle animals, now he's dead. We've got to give him a proper funeral. So they gathered some wood from the forest, there's plenty there, they made a funeral pyre. They lifted up the monk, put him on top and lit the wood. And the flames started going up and they thought, oh, we don't have to do anything anymore, the, the, the fire will burn the monk. And off they went up to gather the herbs. This was in the sutras, taught by the Buddha. And the following morning, you can imagine how impressed they were when they saw the monk walk into their village for arms. Not even his robe was charred. Perfectly okay. Because that's what happens if you get into these deep meditations and by mistake we take you to the crematorium and we put you in the oven and they light the fires. When they open the door again, hi, it's me again. <laughs> <laughs> You're perfectly, in, and that's a weird thing, but that actually happens. Some of the strange things which happen in deep meditation, your body is actually protected. So that's what happens when a person may be declared dead, maybe they're not. Yes? What would happen if this has happened to come after meditation while your body is still in the oven? In the oven? Oh, you just, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you get some great powers after these deep meditations. So you'll be fine, don't worry about it. Give it a try. <laughs> And if, if I'm wrong, you won't be able to say, I told you so. <laughs> Ajahn Brahm, please help. After two days of intensive sitting, my waist is protesting on me. Another six days to go. What should I do? Ah, oh, forget about your waist. None of my business. But you say, of intensive sitting. What the heck are you doing, intensive? <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, if you carry on like that, you know, if you do intensive meditation, you end up in the... Intensive care unit. <laughs> so don't do intensive, do it kindly. You see in the back of these t-shirts? Make peace, be kind, be gentle. This is not a boot camp, this is not training for the US Marines. This is Buddhism, compassion, kind, gentle. If you're intense, you just don't understand meditation, do it gently. Don't have all these goals, I'm really going to meditate more. No, just do it moment by moment. If it's the time to come out of meditation, come out. Otherwise, keep going. Dear sir, is it okay not to ask? What? 
In my practice of the Buddha's teachings, be it taking precepts, meditation, or understanding the Dharma, I nearly, I really got nothing to ask. I feel everything is okay with me and the Dharma. Is it okay? I have nothing to ask except this one question. <laughs> You've asked. <laughs> You've broken it. So, okay, yeah. No, you don't have to ask a question. A request rather than a question. While most chairs are unoccupied by people, the majority are occupied by rugs, cushions and other signs of ownership. Please liberate the chairs so they may be available for all. It's interesting. Isn't it? Have you got your favourite chair? And you leave things on? Whose chair is it? So you can sit anywhere in this hall. Even here. But you have to give a talk. <laughs> Okay, if there's not enough chairs, maybe just take your rugs and stuff off so other people can use them. Because, you know, then you can use another chair. It doesn't belong to you. I know you've got your favourite spot. But what you can do is actually you can see who are the really good meditators in this room. And go and sit in their spot. It might be the chair, it may be the cushion. <laughs> that is the reason. So <laughs> go and see what happens. A request, okay, most of the chairs. What considers right livelihood should we walk on the Noble Eightfold Path sincerely for liberation as a lay person? Anything which doesn't harm other people and harm yourself. So, you know, the harmless, opera, uh, harmless occupations, you know, they're, they're the very, very best. Being a bus driver, beautiful occupation. But being, oh, I don't want to be a, I want to be a lawyer. I want to be an accountant. I want to do something. But, you know, as long as they're not harming, it can't be perfect. And there's no such thing as perfection in livelihood, but it's good enough. And a lot of times I said, I think, in the Nolamarato, it's not so much what you do, what profession you do, you're a teacher or you're a lawyer or you're a policeman, it's how you do that. So much of what makes right livelihood, it's not in the livelihood, but what you make out of that livelihood. You now, for example, they say in the right livelihoods of the Buddha, that being a prison officer is wrong livelihood. Because in those days, prison officers would torture and whip and hang people. But these days, many prison officers are really, really kind and they're really trying to help others. Fine. So it really depends what you are. And not so much what you're doing, but how you're doing it. Makes it right livelihood or wrong livelihood. Once you gave a Dharma talk on euthanasia and you support the idea of voluntary euthanasia, if it is based on the four reasons you mentioned. I'm wondering if it's breaking the first precept. Actually, euthanasia is not breaking the first precept. This is an argument I had with, I think, Professor Dhammawi Hari years ago, and, and he praised me so much to other people. He said, because I, I showed him the, the Pali, and it was killing other people. Yourself, that's your karma. You should not interfere with other people's karma. But when it's your own body, your own life, that's your freedom to do what you want with it. And it was an amazing thing that I showed him that, and he said, yep, that's what the party says, you're right there. It's a very fine point. And that's why that there was this case of Chana in the time of the Buddha, and he committed suicide. And the Buddha said that his death will be blameless. There's a powerful saying, this is the Buddha saying his death is blameless. So it's not so much committing suicide as why you do it. And I like to stir traditional Buddhists up by asking, did the Buddha commit suicide? He's supposed to have eaten meat before he died. Surely the Buddha would know with all his powers that that meat was bad for him, was going to kill him. In fact, he told all the other monks, don't eat this. But he ate it himself. Did the Buddha know what he was doing? Or was it a mistake? If it was a mistake, he wasn't very smart. If he knew what he was doing, he knew he was going to end his life. Isn't that suicide? Stir, stir, stir. <laughs> I like stirring people, letting people see different things. Yeah, they, they let go, give up their life faculty. Or eating meat was not such a nice thing to do, but I always liked, there was two monks in the commentaries, Ananda, you know, the great sort of uh, servant of the Buddha, and this other, uh, Dabba Balaputta. And they started this tradition for Ananda. You know, he was supposed to live quite a long time after the Buddha passed away, and he became so famous. 
And this idea of relics we talked about last night, even in the time of the Buddha, the relics were really important to people. Because, you know, you have a relic and people will go to that shrine to visit. And when you go to that shrine, you'll have, you know, um, places for giving the, the pilgrims food and places they can stay. Relics and pilgrims were big business. So had all these, these two kingdoms were trying to get Ananda to die in their realm so they can put a big stupa up and have all these pilgrims come to worship the, the relics of Ananda. And he knew there was a big problem there. So according to the story, he went to the river dividing these two kingdoms, levitated up into the air, and right in the middle, on the boundary, and he meditated on fire, and his whole body just burned spontaneously with fire, and the two ashes fell in perfectly equal piles on either side of the river. That was awesome, that was a very cool way to die. And Dava Maraputa did the same. And interestingly, I always wondered about just the influence of Buddhist monks in ancient Greece. There was a recorded uh, in Greek um, records at the time that there was a monk called Samana Chagas. Samana means monk, who went to the Forum of Athens and immolated himself and caused a sensation in Athens. That's the only Greek which I know. And I'd really love to actually see the whole passage and someone who's fluent in ancient Greek to read the whole thing. Because it was a Buddhist monk, he burned himself somehow or other and created a huge sensation. If he'd just gone on to a funeral pile, got some wood, people would have dragged him off. It seems like in ancient Greece we have a record of this sort of thing happening. Fascinating. Anyway, what is the role of dreaming in meditation? <laughs> it's just escaping, not doing the work, wasting time. It also means you should be in bed. If you're going to dream, do it in the right place. It's like going to toilet, you know, in the hall. It's not the right place to go to toilet. We have, we have toilets for that. It's like eating in your bedroom. We have the kitchen or the dining room for eating. So if you want to dream, we have beds for dreaming. Not here, okay? So if you feel tired, go to bed for goodness sake. The last question. If we believe in rebirth, then your idea to weight the voting system according to age doesn't work. An 80-year-old person has just as many shares as a young person because they will be reborn again. Is there a difference between rebirth and reincarnation? Uh, rebirth and reincarnation are basically the same. There's a small difference, but it's not really worth arguing about at this stage. But about weighting the voting system according to age doesn't work. An 80-year-old person has just as many shares as a young person, but if you're a really good and wise 80-year-old, you won't get reborn again. Or you get reborn in the heaven realm. The smart people do, but only the stupid people come back down here again. So why should we weigh the waiting age to stupid old people who are going to come back again? So my argument still holds. <laughs> I just got out of that one just by a hair's breadth. So, okay, it's 9.30 now, so I hope you had an entertaining evening. There's a lot of you know, jokes and funny stories and maybe not taking your questions as seriously as they deserve, but imagine if I was serious for an hour and a half, then you'd all be dreaming and bored stiff. <laughs> So by this stage of the day, I always like to make it alive, you know, say a few funny stories and just to make it interesting because there's so much information, the important stuff you will absorb. And the other stuff, maybe if there's an important question, you can ask it again. So hopefully you've enjoyed this evening and now is the time for dreaming, if you really want to do dreaming. Or if you have got energy, carry on meditating, you can dream later on. Or you can dream when you're, when you're having your, your breakfast tomorrow morning. No, no one goes to sleep when they're eating. It's amazing because it's important for you. And if you are meditating, if it's really important, you don't fall asleep. So, and you know, what? another thing I often say, a lot of times people get very tired when they're sitting meditation here. 
and they, they're so sleepy, and they go to bed and they can't sleep. It's weird, isn't it? I mean, when you're here, you fall sleepy. When you go to bed, you're perfectly awake. Something's going wrong there. <laughs> if that's the case, take your meditation cushion and put it in your, your room and take your bed and move it into here. <laughs> <laughs> so you, where you're sleepy, you sleep, but where you're awake, you can meditate. Okay, anyway. So, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Yes, I feel the testosterone coming up. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>